Hey everyone, thanks for joining me today. I'm Rebecca Mandeville, licensed psychotherapist, certified clinical trauma professional, and the author of Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed. And one of the reasons I published uh, Rejected, Shamed, and Blamed in advance of publishing my research, uh, which I'm still uh, crunching numbers and getting the data together because I have over 10 years of research to get out, uh, is I wanted people to understand the clinical consequences of being scapegoated by your family uh, specifically, but this could also be via extended family, in-laws, step families, um, uh, families you marry into, because there is so little information out there um, about family scapegoating. Throughout the course of my book, I talk about the various types of consequences that can occur as a result of being a victim of family scapegoating abuse, both as a, a child and as an adult child. But today I'd like to go over specifically um, the, the clinical consequences that uh, might be recognizable uh, to a clinician, to a therapist, to someone um, who might be able to offer this sort of help that someone who's been scapegoated desperately needs. And the consequences of being scapegoated by family can be severe. And there is the uh, development of trauma, trauma symptoms that often the FSA adult survivor has no idea they're suffering from. And it can be really overwhelming. I know when I'm working with clients and they suddenly begin to identify symptoms as we're, we're working with the workbook I use right now in my practice, which is Transforming the Living Legacy of Trauma, a workbook for survivors and therapists by Janina Fisher, PhD. And they had no idea that qualities or aspects or characteristics and ways of being that they've been experiencing lifelong that they really thought is who they were was actually trauma symptoms or connected to trauma symptoms. So the clinical consequences that I'll be reviewing today often will have their roots in trauma. And I'm going to read you right now the types of symptoms and self-reports that I'll be keeping a lookout for as a psychotherapist when I'm working with someone who may have suffered from this type of family abuse. Uh, it will help guide my questions, what I will ask as a clinician to draw out more information. And uh, it's these are symptoms that you yourself might relate to and you may want to jot some of these down. You can download the transcript here from YouTube. Um, it is copyrighted, but you certainly can uh, use this to be able to highlight, make notes, and be able to share this with someone that you may be working with or may eventually work with who has the proper training to help someone who has suffered from perhaps lifelong this form of psycho-emotional abuse. Before I begin, I, I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't subscribed, you may want to do so. And for those of you who are subscribed and wondering why you don't get notified of my videos, you need to go back to the subscription tab on my homepage and click on that white notification bell. And that's how you'll be notified by YouTube. I've released a new video and I try to get a video out one to two times a week. So as a trauma-informed therapist, what will I be looking for and assessing when someone enters my practice and they believe they may be in the family scapegoat role? The types of things that I'll notice is the client will have a, a dramatically altered relationship to themselves and to others due to having been scapegoated by their family. And that is because the entire sense of self 
especially if the scapegoating started early on when the neural pathways were still forming. The brain is forming, uh, 80% of the brain's formed by the time we're four, five, six years old. So if your neural pathways developed around this core belief that was instilled into you that there's something wrong with you, or that you're bad or defective, different or difficult. And if you hear that enough, you will have, of course, a very compromised relationship to yourself and that will affect your relationship with others. I know many people who had the, what I call the scapegoat narrative, loudly told to friends, family, strangers on the street, right in front of them they were present in the room and they heard how difficult they were, how different they were, or bad they were, or you can't believe her or him, they're a liar. It's not hidden at all. Now, sometimes it is. I did a very informal little poll here on my YouTube channel. I don't remember the exact percentage. It might be down to 24, 28% now. At one time it was as high as in the 40, 40% range of people who said the scapegoat narrative, the uh, smearing happened right in front of them. In fact, sometimes more, um, it, it happened uh, more when there was someone in the room to hear the story and it wasn't always going on behind their back. Another thing I'll look for when I'm assessing someone who may be a victim of family abuse is um, Diff, poor functioning with what we call activities of day, daily living or ADLs or hyper functioning. Um, someone who is go, go, going and they seem real high functioning and they uh, seem to be on top of everything and they're running as fast as they can uh, to do everything that they can. And they are really in a state of, of flight, you could say, as a trauma response um, and not, not able to stop because then those very painful feelings may arise. Um, so that, that would be hyper-functioning versus, um, you might say, hypo-functioning, um, struggling to get out of bed, struggling to do self-care, struggling to even want to reach out to form relationships and uh, maybe having difficulty at work or difficulty working at all and, and uh, may find themselves back living at home with their parents, which isn't gonna help their situation, but they just are having trouble functioning in life. Another thing that I'll be looking for is my um, client may report to me, they've had a, a long history of, seeking treatment or seeking out therapists, trying to get help, working with a lot of different therapists or coaches, and nothing seems to help. They, they feel that they maybe got a little bit of help or got something out of it, but that the core issue or pain wasn't addressed and they don't even know what the core issue or pain is. And another thing that's pretty common is the, the client will tell me a variety of diagnoses they've received in the past, uh, bipolar, by, uh, borderline personality disorder, um, histrionic personality disorder, major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, um, things that are found here in the United States in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, but trauma uh, even post-traumatic stress disorder usually won't have shown up in that person's diagnostic history. So I will see a long string of different diagnosis and the client is confused as to how that's helpful because the treatment that they've had may have helped a little bit, as I mentioned earlier, but not a lot. How I'll start noticing symptoms of complex trauma is the client uh, may tell me or may display uh, through their, their behaviors in their life and the stories that they come in and share with me about their life, that the world feels like an unsafe, dangerous place. Uh, and indeed, 
that is true for them because their nervous system is constantly being activated. The amygdala here in the brain is firing up over and over again due to triggers. But the client doesn't know they're being triggered. The client doesn't know the brain's firing up and going into a state of fight, flight, freeze or fawn. Um, they just feel that they are overactivated. <laughs> they may feel very tense. They may feel exhausted. They may feel depleted. They may feel like they have to take to their bed and their bed's the only safe place in the world. And that's uh, a sign of hypo arousal. They may, as I said earlier, be going a mile a minute, which would be hyper arousal. Another, um, another sign of trauma and scapegoating that will be evident to me when I'm assessing a client is the client will feel that nobody cares about them. This isn't always true, but often, even if they have a good circle of friends, they may have a real supportive partner. They'll at least be pockets like little holes they fall into. And when they're in there and it's really because they've been triggered, they're activated as something has happened to wound them that is mirroring something from their family of origin. In many cases, they'll go deep into that dark hole. And despite all the evidence that they may be loved by their chosen family, uh, by people in their life, they believe that nobody cares about them. There's no ability to expand the perspective beyond that dark, dark tunnel. And it's understandable because what's happening during those times is the past reality is feeling true today. And again, if you're in contact with family that's still scapegoating you, um, it's not your past reality, it's your present reality. And how much is that activating you? Something else that I look for is gonna be the topic of my next video. So I hope you'll tune in because it deserves its own, own uh, video, dedicated video, and that is Structural dissociation. Structural dissociation is different than dissociative identity disorder where you have multiple personalities and none of them know what the other ones are doing. This is structural dissociation. And that is very common. I see this often with people who have been scapegoated by their families. And there's a whole series of symptoms I look for in assessing structural dissociation. And so I hope you'll tune in because that is the next video I'm going to put out. And we will go over what structural dissociation is, how it's experienced, what a clinician who is aware of structural dissociation looks for, and how we can treat it. And again, if you haven't subscribed, you can hit the red click button down there in the corner of this video, and that will allow you to subscribe easily. And don't forget to tap that white notification bell so you'll know when my video comes out on structural dissociation. See you soon.